Well-known fact that increase in left ventricular distension cause increase in force of contraction. This phenomenon called Friend-Starling mechanism. Let's take a clinical example, aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis causes increase in aortic resistance. This causes decrease in flow through aortic valve, thereby it causes increase in amount of blood in left ventricle, that is called left ventricular and diastolic volume. This causes increase in stretch of left ventricular walls, and very rapidly this causes increase in force of contraction. It's what we've called Friend-Starling mechanism. Friend-Starling mechanism caused primarily by increase in myofilum and calcium responsiveness. But interesting that right after this initial rise in contractility and over the next 10 to 15 minutes, myocardial contractility slowly continued to increase. And exactly this slow increase in contractility that occurs after initial rise in force of contraction and lasts for over 10 to 15 minutes, called unwrapped effect, also called slow flow response. Now about the mechanism of unwrapped effect. Initially, myocardial stretch induced release of preformed angiotensin II from cardiomyocytes. Angiotensin II will activate angiotensin I receptor that subsequently promotes release of aldosterone that will activate mineralocorticoid receptor on cardiomyocytes. Also, stretch induced release of endothelin I that activate endothelin I receptor. It's important because the activation of endothelin receptor is essential for activation of mineralocorticoid receptor by aldosterone. In activated state, mineralocorticoid receptor stimulates the activity of sodium hydrogen exchanger. Also, very important feature is that when angiotensin II activates angiotensin I receptor, it promotes transactivation of epithelial growth factor receptor. And activation of angiotensin 1 receptor, activation of epithelial growth factor receptor, and also stress from mechanical stretch, they all activate the crucial enzyme NOX2 on sarcolemma of cardiomyocytes. NOX2 stands for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate oxidase. In activated state, this enzyme converts oxygen to superoxide, which is very aggressive free radical. So, activation of NOX2 results in production of free radicals that are also called reactive oxygen species. And now very important concept. Reactive oxygen species in cytoplasm stimulate production of reactive oxygen species in mitochondria with their subsequent release into the cytoplasm. This process called ROS-induced ROS release. To explain this, its cytoplasm and its mitochondria and in mitochondria during aerobic activity, oxygen underwent one electron reduction within the electron transport chain and becomes superoxide. We already know that activation of NOx2 results in production of reactive oxygen species, primarily superoxide. And the concept is that reactive oxygen species in cytoplasm trigger opening of mitochondrial permeability transition pores that are located on mitochondrial membrane. And activation of mitochondrial transition pores greatly increase production of reactive oxygen species in mitochondria, primarily superoxide. Because superoxide is very active and thereby dangerous molecule, it must be rapidly converted into the less aggressive molecule. This conversion is provided by an enzyme called superoxide dismutase, which is located in both mitochondrial matrix and cytoplasm. Superoxide dismutase converts superoxide into hydrogen peroxide that is less aggressive and more membrane permeable molecule. Because of its high permeability it can cross through mitochondrial membrane into the cytoplasm. And together with reactive oxygen species that are already in cytoplasm, this results in great increase in concentration of free radicals in cytoplasm, particularly hydrogen peroxide molecules. So, because of initial activation of NOx2 enzyme, a large amount of reactive oxygen species are released from mitochondria into the cytoplasm, and exactly this event called ROS induced ROS release. Important that because superoxide dismutase located in both cytoplasm and mitochondrial matrix, in the end we have a lot of hydrogen peroxide molecules in cytoplasm. Hydrogen peroxide molecules have very interesting fissure. They serve as signaling molecules. And in sarcoplasm, they stimulate the activity of redox sensitive kinases through increase in their phosphorylation. And kinases subsequently stimulate activity of sodium hydrogen exchanger. So, reactive oxygen species activate kinases 
that stimulate already increased activity of sodium hydrogen exchanger because recall that aldosterone activate mineralocorticoid receptor and in activated state mineralocorticoid receptor stimulate activity of sodium hydrogen exchanger. So these two effects are potentiate each other and cause very strong stimulation of sodium hydrogen exchanger. The main function of sodium hydrogen exchanger is regulation of pH inside the cell. It regulates pH by exchanging intracellular hydrogen molecules for extracellular sodium molecules. So with very strong stimulation of sodium hydrogen exchanger, more hydrogen molecules leave the cell, so intracellular environment become more alkaline, and alkaline environment increase microfilament calcium sensitivity. This results in increase in force of contraction. Also because with stimulation of sodium hydrogen exchanger more sodium molecules are going into the cell, this causes increase in intracellular sodium concentration. And the crucial feature is that increase in intracellular sodium level affects function of sodium calcium exchanger. Sodium calcium exchanger provides transport of three sodium molecules for one calcium molecule across the sarcolemma of cardiomyocytes. The main function of sodium calcium exchanger is to provide relaxation for cardiomyocytes, and relaxation occurs when intracellular calcium level decreases. So sodium calcium exchanger transports three sodium molecules into the cell for one calcium molecule that leaves the cell. This activity of sodium calcium exchanger when it transports sodium into and calcium out of the cell called forward mode or calcium efflux mode because calcium leaves the cell. But also sodium calcium exchanger can transport these two ions in reverse direction calcium into and sodium out of the cell. Such activity of sodium calcium exchanger called reverse mode or calcium influx mode because calcium is going into the cell. Because the main function of sodium calcium exchanger is to provide relaxation, forward mode predominates. So sodium calcium exchanger can operate in both directions. It all depends on electrochemical driving forces. Sodium calcium exchanger is a passive transporter that does not use energy. Recall that sodium and calcium are extracellular ions, so for example let's take forward mode. The export of calcium is going against concentration gradient, and any process that is going against concentration gradient requires energy, that in this case provided by simultaneous transportation of another ion by concentration gradient, and in this case it's sodium molecules. And if we are talking about reverse mode, in reverse mode sodium calcium exchanger transports sodium out of the cell against concentration gradient and calcium into the cell by concentration gradient. And in which mode will function sodium calcium exchanger depends on the driving force of sodium calcium exchanger that is determined primarily by sodium intracellular concentration and to a much less extent by calcium intracellular concentration. If sodium concentration inside the cell substantially decreases, it induces sodium calcium exchanger to work in forward mode. And if sodium intracellular concentration substantially increases, it induces reverse mode. But if changes in sodium intracellular concentration are not dramatic, so the difference between sodium concentration outside and inside the cell is not substantial, sodium calcium exchanger does not transport anything. So it's in passive mode and this state called thermodynamic equilibrium. So the activity of this exchanger is highly depends on sodium intracellular concentration. And when due to the activation of sodium hydrogen exchanger, sodium intracellular concentration rapidly increase, it inhibit forward mode and induce reverse mode on sodium calcium exchanger. In reverse mode it transports sodium out of the cell and calcium into the cell. So calcium influx into the cell increase thereby intracellular calcium concentration increase, and the highest calcium concentration in cytosol, the highest contractility. Recall that the highest calcium concentration in the cytosol, the more calcium molecules will bind to troponin. The more troponin affects tropomyosin conformation, the more binding sites on actin molecule become exposed, the more myosin molecules will bind to actin molecule, this will create the higher number of actin myosin bonds, that will develop the higher peak muscle tension and thereby higher force of contraction. By the way, unreactive effect can be blocked by three major drugs, 
by angiotensin 1 receptor antagonist as lazartan, by endotensin receptor blockers, and by mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist as pironolactan. So this slow and prolonged increase in force of contraction after initial rapid myocardial stretch is what we've called an effect. 